At Jaipur each year, there are certain sessions that we have year after year, uh, though with obviously different um, uh, contributors. And one of them is, for example, the travel session, which we're going to have tomorrow, uh, when travel writers read from their work. But another one that we always have, and one of the most popular, uh, is called the Biographer's Ball. Uh, and in it, uh, it's a thing about process. It's a thing about how a biographer chooses a subject, what makes them want to stalk some character, probably dead, uh, for three or four or five or six or longer years, uh, and how do they go about assembling their materials, um, building it into a story, uh, and actually writing a biography. Um, so we've got four incredibly diverse biographers here, um, none of whom I think would primarily describe themselves as biographers as their main uh, 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 modus vivendi or their main uh, uh, job, but all four of them have written uh, magnificent books that are nearly biographies or almost biographies or, or are biographies. Uh, Ruby Lal, who's going to be our first, uh, is a magnificent historian of the Mughals uh, based at Emory in Atlanta uh, and has written three books about women in Indian history. Um, one uh, was on the Mughal harem. The second was on childhoods and girlhood. Um, and the third, which I think has been uh, the most uh, acclaimed and uh, uh, received by far the, the widest uh, 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 notice and uh, the most enthusiastic and, and, and wonderful reviews uh, within the last month, because it's a, it's a book that's just come out, is about the magnificent um, Mughal Empress Nur Jahan. Simon Winchester has written a cornucopia of goodies uh, in, in, in various forms of nonfiction. Um, but um, one of his uh, most uh, uh, wonderful was on W.C. Minor, um, uh, who uh, we heard about yesterday, those of you who were at the uh, opening session. Um, the, uh, the madman who was one of the largest contributors to the Oxford English Dictionary, madman and murderer. Uh, yeah. And so we're going to hear more about the, 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 the process that led him to that. Oh, no, we're talk about that. You're not going to talk about that? Okay, we'll talk about something else then, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Maya Jasanov, historian at Harvard, uh, has written on 18th century India, uh, on uh, 18th century uh, U uh, US, uh, the, 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 the loyalists and the loyalist diaspora, and most recently, a sort of biography of Conrad, which is what we're going to hear about, uh, I think, from her. Uh, and finally, Wade Davis, who is both academic and explorer, an unusual combination outside Indiana Jones films. Um, uh, but I think today we'll talk about uh, his, his, his very uh, many years of stalking um, the climber Mallory. So um, do you want to kick off, uh, Ruby, and then we'll go across the panel in this direction. Thank you, um, and thanks for being here. Um, it's a rather mixed story of um, how uh, I met Noor Jahan. I've met her in many ways um, and in many different times in my life. Uh, so I want to begin with that moment uh, when I was, so that goes to about 43 years ago, uh, I was seven, um, uh, afternoon of storytelling in Dehradun uh, with my mother. Uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful storyteller. Uh, she told me many stories over time, uh, but I remember that one afternoon uh, we were playing uh, Gen Gitta, which is an American game of jacks. Uh, and I remember I grew very bored. It was a very hot summer afternoon. Uh, and I said to her, um, I'm bored. I want to hear a new story. Um, so she told me a new story that she hadn't told before. Um, and it was about Noor Jahan. Uh, my mother called her Maharani in Hindi, which means queen of queens. Um, I was always besotted by her stories. Uh, but this one just did something to me. Um, I mention this because uh, there, are, there are sediments, uh, clearly, of that afternoon that stayed with me. Um, and over time, uh, I fell in love with uh, Mughal history, uh, with Mughal women, to be precise, um, that I've written about. Uh, and when I was finishing my second book, uh, Chiki Sarkar, who headed uh, Penguin India at that time, wrote to me saying, um, there isn't a critical biography of Noor Jahanan, and um, I believe you are the woman to do it. Uh, 
when I heard that, I started kicking myself in the back, thinking, this was supposed to be my idea. <laughs> so I walk into uh, work, uh, and I have a lovely Moroccan colleague who uh, I speak with quite often, and I told her what had happened. And she said, Ruby, in Morocco, we believe that it's not authors that choose their subjects. Uh, it's subjects that choose their authors. So, so that's how this whole story began uh, all over again uh, in 2012. Um, what became central to writing and to process um, are several things. One is history itself, um, and really quite centrally the question of evidence. Um, how are you going to do this, that, and the other history? Uh, what constitutes the ground of evidence? Something that I've, um, uh, you know, uh, spent 20 years thinking, uh, writing those books. Essentially, writing about subjects where we believed we couldn't write about those subjects. So really, um, uh, thinking what constitutes evidence. And uh, in effect, the point was that uh, evidence is wide-ranging. Uh, it's not just state-sponsored uh, documents. Uh, evidence is um, in many forms, in many genres, but not least uh, in, the, in the questions that we, that we take to these subjects. So, so that was one very uh, big issue here. Uh, the second one was really like my mother's story, Noor Jahan's life. Uh, she's a household name uh, in South Asia, but really soaked in legends, uh, particularly legends of love. Uh, and the legend stopped really in 1611 uh, when her life's best work began. So I didn't want to leave legends because legends are not gossip. We think legends are gossip, but there's a, there's a wonder, wonderful axis around which um, there has to be some agreement uh, in legends. So I wanted to take legends, uh, the uh, invocations of tourist guides, the retellings of uh, the elderly folks in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, the legends of history, uh, if you will, uh, as grounds of, of um, uh, storytelling. So these were grounds of history, and then uh, there was a life I wanted to write about, uh, the grounds of biography, uh, which also have a finality to it. Uh, in the traditional paradigm. So there's a beginning, middle, and at the end, uh, you kill your subject. Uh, <laughs> I refuse to kill my subject. The last chapter of the book is called uh, Beyond 1627, uh, and beyond um, extension, continuation, uh, overreaching. She lives in the public imagination, um, but I was also um, installing her as one of the great Mughals of India. When we think about the great Mughals of India, we think of uh, the male Mughals, but here's a, here's a co-sovereign. Uh, and I just uh, very quickly want to speak about uh, the evidence base by quickly just saying uh, that even in legends and popular imagination, uh, you hear about Noor's bar, but you hear it in bullet points. For instance, people say things like, uh, she, issued of, she issued coins. There were imperial orders that were struck in her name. She appeared in the, um, in the jaroka, that is the um, windows of the balconies, all technical signs of sovereignty. Uh, but how to give concreteness to this? How to give um, a full-bodied character to the, to the context, so much so that the context itself becomes narrative? Uh, and so, um, so I'd love to take this up in the Q&A and more with William, but really the last uh, point uh, about art history, about process, uh, where historians tend to, myself included, have tended to use art as, as, as insertions, as um, uh, illustrations. But I really, in effect, in the last few years, went to graduate school in art history and had to teach myself the technicality of, of art because she was the first woman to be, to be actually portrayed, that is not stylized portraiture. And there's several, I'd like to show one painting of hers right here, which is in the Rampur Raza Library, uh, right here. 
painted by the poet laureate, I, I'm sorry, painted by the uh, painter laureate, uh, Abul Hassan Nadiru Zaman, meaning the uh, wonder of the age. Uh, there's a whole chapter in the book in which um, I tried to get into the head of Abul Hassan, wondering how he thought of this uh, style, because the inheritance that he had was of Naika mode, which is beautified women. Uh, and he completely breaks from this uh, tradition in casting Noor Jahan as loading the musket. She's uh, supposed to be um, a very fine hunter, another sign of Islamic sovereignty. Uh, and uh, this is a painting uh, that's classified by art historians as the real Noor Jahan painted somewhere between 1612 and 17, which has very serious implications uh, on her sovereignty. Uh, so this was known um, uh, painting, for example, and there are several others that become very strong grounds uh, of writing this book. Um, I think I'll... Um, Hi, one question. Um, how, uh, how much of her own writing survives? Were you able to recover her voice at all? Uh, yes, so I think this is another question in biography that comes up again and again. Uh, if we are going to go by a memoir or letters or uh, uh, exchanges of that kind, then the biography of Noor Jahan is impossible. We do not have, but we have her poetry. We have copious writings uh, by almost all the court chroniclers of the time, including her husband, the paymaster general, a man called Mudamed Khan, uh, the first uh, inscriber, a man called Farid Bakri, who wrote uh, a, a, a collection of 365 biographical entries of Mughal noblemen in which he included one woman called Noor Jahan, and that's the longest uh, entry, which becomes the, um, uh, the genre for an 18th century collection of Mughal biographies. Uh, and then we have innumerable paintings, we have her coins, we have her imperial orders, another technical sign of sovereignty. And uh, again, the orders were known. Uh, when I read those orders closely in Persian, I was very struck by her signature. It said... She was literate, she could write. Yes, yeah. Noor Jahan Padshah Begum, which means Padshah meaning the king, Begum is an honorific, but literally the lady emperor. So there are, the, the, there's all this unfolding that's going on in the, um, uh, in the documents. Do you think that she was, had such an unusual position partly because her husband, Jahangir, fell apart so badly with opium addiction and alcohol and so on, or, or was it because she was just an incredibly forceful and remarkably charismatic woman? Um, I think it's a combination of factors that lead to, uh, to her rise. Uh, the, the thing about Jahangir we should remember, uh, I think it's an old trope to think of him as an alcoholic and, you know... Uh, uh, it's he a, it's he a, himself puts down his consumption. Yes, he In, in his he diary does. he charts, yes. exactly, and, and is very proud when he gets his, his alcohol... His cups. <laughs> yeah, when he gets down to, to only having whatever it is, three cups of triple distilled... <laughs> that's right. But he, but he never abdicates the throne. I mean, that's an important point. But also really uh, his whole investment uh, in pondering, in thinking sovereignty, in thinking the wider landscape. So certainly he, but also her father, who's the wazir at this time, uh, her older brother Asaf Khan, uh, an important nobleman, and Shah Jahan, her stepson in the, in the early years. This is a very close circle. I also think that her first marriage, which is also a bullet point rendering, is a very uh, critical moment because she goes to Bengal. Uh, and this is the moment when Bengal is like um, the Wild West. Uh, it is, you know, it is Some would say it is still. Well, and just then, just then incorporated into have at least the one Muslim Bengali on this panel who can... <laughs> <laughs> incorporated into the Mughal Empire. So um, the early learnings of center-state relations, where would she finesse hunting, uh, the land of the Bengal tiger, but it's the whole uh, landscape and the mach machinations, um, you know, that allow her to, to bring all of these things. So I think a certain kind of upbringing, the first marriage, uh, and then eventually the, um, uh, you know, the network, the network of support. In fact, she's an immigrant. She's not, she's not from India. She's a, she's a Persian, this extraordinary fact. 
she is, she's born on the road in Kandahar, um, but you know, she's, she's a few months by the time she comes to India. So, uh, you know, we were just talking about pre-nation time, a time in which um, identities are not fixed the way we imagine them to be fixed today. So I think um, she'll have very much, uh, you know, partaken of the multilingual, the multi, uh, the, the, the plural context of Al-Hind, really, that's what we are talking about. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about W.C. Minor, I hope you'll forgive me, nor the only other biography, really, um, which was of William Smith, the creator of the first a geological map of the world that came out in, I think, 2001. But this relates to, I think, the book that remains my favorite, um, which is a, a biography of a man called Joseph Needham. And um, it came about like this. I had written a book in 1996, I think, about the Yangtze River. And I'd spent about a year um, traveling up the Yangtze from where it debouches into the East China Sea, near Shanghai, and going up through Nanjing and Chongqing and Wuhan and up to where it rises at a place called Gelandandong in Tibet. And wrote this book. But when I came back to, I think I wrote it, or at least was doing some research in one of the libraries in New York City. And um, I couldn't find much information on the kind of junks that they used in the Yangtze when the river passes through the famous Three Gorges, uh, where the river suddenly becomes very narrow and very ferocious. And before uh, 1906, which was the year that steam navigation came to the, to the river, um, you had to work your upstream junks by having enormous bamboo hawsers attached to the prow and literally thousands of men called trackers who would, in passageways on the mountainside beside the river, pull the boats upstream against this ferocious downstream current. So I had found out very little when I was in China itself about what the design of those boats were like, because they had to be capacious to accommodate the enormous amounts of cargo. See, in, a, in a China. Um, but they had to be flexible and light and all the rest of it. So anyway, I was asking someone who knew a lot about ships in New York um, where I could find out some information. And he said, well, there are two obvious books um, the Junks and Sampans of the Yangtze by G.R.G. G. Worcester, published by Naval Institute Press in Annapolis, Maryland in 1943, or Volume 4, Part 3 of Science and Civilization by Joseph Needham. And I'd heard of neither of these books nor, neither of, nor either of these authors. But the next day, I was up near where I live, sort of upstate, and there was a wonderful bookstore in Salisbury, Connecticut, called Lion's Head Books, run by a man called Mike McCabe, the like of whom we seldom see in bookstores today. But he knew, it seemed to me, every book that had ever been written. And I said to him, Mike, I've got this problem. I'm doing some research on the junks of the Yangtze, and there are two books terribly obscure, books which I wonder if you could order for me. And he said, OK, well, what's the first one? And I said, um, uh, The Junks and Sampans of the Yangtze. And he said, oh, G.R.G. G. Worcester. Yes, we normally have a copy of that. And he, <laughs> he reached to an upper shelf, because it's an octavo book, and pulled it down, and $25. And he said, well, OK, what's the next book? And I said, um, uh, volume four, part three of a book called, I believe, Science and Civilization. And he cut me off, and he said, you mean Joseph Needham? And I said, uh, yes, Mike. That's what I mean. And he looked at me with the expression. He said, uh, are you telling me you've never heard of Joseph Needham? <laughs> and and I, I, said, I said, I'm sorry, Mike. And he said, uh, he looked at me with the expression of someone who's looked at the cat to see what it's dragged into the kitchen, you know? <laughs> and said, well, this is utterly reprehensible. Joseph Needham is probably the most famous scholar, English scholar that ever worked in China. He created... Uh, the longest book in the English language ever written about China, 24 volumes, 4 million words, 
still in, in print, Cambridge University Press, and we occasionally, we very, very rarely get complete sets, and there would be many thousands of dollars, but we occasionally get single volumes, and I seem to remember that downstairs we have one. So he disappeared <laughs> like, like the white rabbit into his hole, and he went down and rummaged around for a few minutes and came back with this enormous tome of a book and blew the dust off it, and it was indeed volume four, part three. <laughs> so, and that was $75, so for 100 bucks, I, my quest was over. So I, I paid him his money and said, you know, our, a remarkable chap, and went to the car, and I was sitting there, and it was obvious what Junks and Sampans of the Yangtze was about, so I put that on the back seat. But I looked at this book, volume four, part three, by Needham. It was devoted to nautics, N-A-U-T-I-C-S, it was everything to do. So I'm yawning. There. You were, actually. <laughs> I think I just. <laughs> it was everything to do with China's relationship with water. So it was about canals and irrigation. It was about boats. It was about sails. It was about rudders. It was about lighthouses. It was about anchors. And it had these exquisite diagrams of the junks that worked their way. Through, uh, the, uh, through the three gorges of China. And I thought, who the devil was this chap? Needham, Joseph. And I looked up in the also by, and it listed the entirety of the volumes in this set in alphabetical order. So it's astronomy and biology and chemistry, ending up with zoology, and there was medicine, and there was nautics here, and there was civil engineering. And I thought, what an amazing chap this, this fellow must be. So I, I did a bit of sort of cursory research and I found out that he had been born in 1900, died in 1995, was master of his college at Cambridge, Keyes College, Cambridge. And the way he became turned on to China, because he was a biochemist, was through an amazingly, if you like, erotic incident, which I'll happily talk about later once we <laughs> dealt with, with process. Um, but he was, he, was, um, he was an amazing fellow. He was a communist. He was deeply intellectual, multilingual. He could speak in something like 13 languages when he was 20. He was also a nudist, um, <laughs> and he practiced Morris dancing, which is this weird... <laughs> and the summer, the thought of this very tall man, nude, doing Morris dancing. And he also, only, only bells around his extremities. Bells around his, most of his extremities, anyway. And his, um, he also played the accordion, which I... At least I thought he didn't play the, the cymbals, which would have been very dangerous. The accordion, which, which just reminds me of the, the definition of a gentleman. Is a gentleman is a man who knows how to play the accordion, but doesn't. <laughs> so he clearly was not a gentleman. But anyway, so um, I, I, I'll finish this because I really want to hear the other two people. But um, so he is revered, although there's some controversy, uh, by the, and he was incidentally banned from America for 25 years, and that's another story in and of itself. But he was, he's revered, no, not for something, something far, far worse, um, but not sexual, I'm happy to say these days. And he was um, revered in the Sinological Establishment, and there is the Needham Research Institute in Cambridge, which I approached cautiously, because in no way am I a Sinologist. And they initially were very hostile to the idea of a non-sinologist ever dealing with so magisterial a figure as Joseph Needham. And, but mercifully, the mathematician who ran the NRI, a student of Needham's interest in mathematics, which was profound and knowledgeable, had read this book of mine, The Professor and the Madman, and thought that maybe Winchester can do a similarly competent job with Needham. And so eventually they gave me permission and then I got into the archives, and the archives are amazing. I mean, not just papers and letters, and, but also every matchbox and every theater ticket and every bill, and which chronicled a life full of ardent romance, because he was a philanderer of, the, of titanic proportions. <laughs> but, but anyway, I'll leave you for that. But, but, so I wrote the book, and the NRI were, were happy with it. And, but, but the process of getting there belongs the real hero is this chap, Mike McCabe, who's one of the great booksellers of the, of the planet. <laughs> I'd like to follow. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't think that anyone in the audience is particularly eager to hear from the rest of us. We would happily just just go back to you. Uh, you know. um, well, uh, onto the onto the somewhat uh, uh, drearier and less colorful life uh, of the person that I wrote about, uh, and you'll hear just quite how uh, dreary and uncolorful uh, shortly. Uh, so I just wrote a book about uh, the novelist Joseph Conrad, who's best known. Uh, here in the U.S., I think, for his 1899 uh, novella, Heart of Darkness, and uh, perhaps even better known for the movie that was made based on Heart of Darkness by Francis Ford Coppola, namely Apocalypse Now. Um, and how's that for a claim to fame? You're best known for the movie that someone else made on the basis of your book. Um, so I'm a, a history professor, and uh, it's one of the... Um, uh, perversities of my profession, which helps explain perhaps why my profession isn't quite as well entrenched in the public imagination uh, as it might be, that uh, we tend to think that biography is a very uh, kind of inferior art form. Uh, and no, uh, no historian worth her or his salt in a university would dare to publish a biography unless it's about a figure who no one has ever heard of, which therefore makes it appropriate for scholars to, to go write about. Um, and so there's been this long standing kind of skepticism about biography as a sort of popular genre. You know, the, there's, there's the one flavor of it, which is, you know, white men writing about other white men for the edification of a new generation of white men. Uh, and then there's the other sort of version of it, which is the kind of, you know, put a woman with a frock on the cover and a, written by a woman in a sort of flowery handwriting. And it's sort of a fun romp through, you know, I don't know, 18th century costume history or something like that. Um, so these these are the kinds of things that, that are uh, thought of as biography in the academic world. And so when I started to write about Joseph Conrad, I was emphatically not writing a biography. Uh, I was instead writing a book that was about uh, uh, the, the world circa 1900. And in particular, I had the idea for it and chatting with a friend, uh, talking about how at this moment in world history around 1900, it's the period when the British Empire is at its self-confident height. You could look at British-produced maps of the world at that time, and they would be co colored. Uh, uh, vast portions of the map would be colored pink to indicate British power. And it's the, the image and the moment that is most associated, in literature at least, with, with the figure of Rudyard Kipling and the ideas of East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet or pick up the white man's burden, etc. And I thought to myself, you know, that is a, a, a very familiar image and one that uh, uh, we, we sort of grasp as historians as representing a moment very different from ours, from which we have evolved into the great, you know, liberties and so forth of post-colonial uh, independence. Uh, but then I thought, you know, is this world that produced Kipling and produced that map and that was the sort of high point of British hegemony was also the world of this rather different writer, um, in my view, more interesting than Conrad, uh, than Kipling, uh, namely Joseph Conrad, and that I thought if I looked at the world of Joseph Conrad uh, at that time, I actually didn't see any overlap with that British imperial pink, despite the fact that this figure lived through, you know, he was born in 1857, died in 1924, you know, lived through the great arc of British imperial expansion and consolidation, and yet his books were set in parts of Southeast Asia where the British were not dominant. They were set in uh, Central Africa, famously with Congo, where the British, uh, not in a British domain. Uh, when he uh, uh, wanted to write a book about uh, kind of the rising, uh, the, 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 the fluxes in imperial power of the period, he chose to set it in a fictional Latin American republic. Uh, uh, and, and when he wrote about Europe, he wrote about it from the perspective of often non-British characters. So it was a very kind of different world that he was describing. So my original idea was, okay, I'm gonna use this person as a kind of device to talk about all of these other different parts of the world at this time, and, and in effect paint a different map. Not the ones with the pink, uh, not the map with all the pink bits, but the map with all the other bits. So, okay, as a dutiful historian, I went off to an archive, because that's uh, what, what we do, and because I, I also happen to love doing it, and so I went off to the archives of Rhodes House in Oxford, uh, which uh, are the, uh, yeah, they're the, it's, the, it's the headquarters of the Rhodes Trust, which is itself the legatee of Cecil Rhodes, uh, one of the towering 
uh, imperialists of uh, Conrad's time. Uh, and in Rhodes House, you will find not only all kinds of uh, memorials to this moment of British imperial self-confidence, but you will also find a huge amount of fascinating papers uh, uncovering different parts of the world at this time. So I was going through the papers in particular of a family of Brits who were uh, active in Southeast Asia and had gained power in a region of present-day uh, Malaysia called Sarawak. Uh, and I was going through the papers and sort of, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm in the archives again. This is so great, you know. And as I went through them, I realized, first of all, you know, it's a lot more fun to research the 18th century because the handwriting is actually legible in the 18th century than the 19th century. It's not. So, right. And so, you know, one of the great features of 19th century writing is that they would write, you know, one way like this, and then if they run out of paper, they write across it like that. So I'm sitting there kind of holding these things up and trying to kind of read one line off of the other and so forth, and I'm thinking, this is not going very well. Um, and then as I go through the papers, I, I realize I have absolutely no idea why I'm looking at these things things. They're saying nothing at all, of course, about Conrad, who had nothing to do with these people. They're telling me nothing that I don't already know from the other historians who have already gone through and looked at all of those documents. Um, and I just don't understand what I'm trying to do here. So I felt completely demoralized. Um, I thought, well, you know, this is uh, a, a, an archival false start, and this whole thing is just going to fall apart, and I don't know what I'm going to write my book about anymore. Um, I went back to teaching, and, uh, and then I realized, you know what I need to do is I actually need to think about why I thought Conrad was interesting. And so rather than go off to some archive and go through all the papers and figure out all the handwriting and everything. I just went to the library. Um, and uh, no booksellers needed when you have a library card for the, you know, libraries. That's what they're there for. We're here in one. Uh, they, they have all of, the, all of the books we could ever want. Um, and I happen to be fortunate to work uh, in a place with one of the greatest libraries uh, in the world and certainly in the country. Um, so I went to the library and there they were, all of the published correspondence, all of the correspondence of Joseph Conrad that is currently extant, published, annotated, beautifully produced with a huge amount of scholarly labor by Cambridge University Press. And I just read through the volumes. So I spent um, hour after hour after hour realizing that uh, uh, I needed to get to know this person. And as I was reading the volumes, I thought, okay, I'm getting to know this person, and he's incredibly depressed all the time. <laughs> um, so that was, that was one thing I will return to in a moment. Um, but the other thing I realized, so as I read them, I thought, okay, I have to turn my book inside out. Rather than trying to kind of write about the world and link it through this person, I need to understand this person and then go back out into the world. I was then left with a couple of other challenges since we're talking about process. So one of the things I found about Conrad and that had attracted me to him is that these novels that he wrote that were set all over the world and dealing with all kinds of issues that will seem very resonant and familiar to us today, such as terrorism and uh, multinational capitalism and uh, technological change and so forth, these were based very much on his own experiences. Uh, and in particular on the experiences he had in the first kind of 35 years of his life, much of which he spent as a sailor. However, out of the 5,000 pages of published correspondence of Conrad's, only the first 50 pages deal with the part of his life that he would then later draw on so much in his fiction. And so I was left with this really difficult puzzle, which was how was I gonna write about this person when the source material for the piece that I was interested in was so, so thin. Uh, and so that's where the archival thing then kicked back in and I was able to go fill in other bits and pieces because every one of us as we go through uh, the, a, a day or a, 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 our lives is generating documentation one way or another, particularly every time we come into contact with an institution uh, or the state in various forms. So I was able to sort of go back and find a lot of documentation. But then I, I did one other thing, uh, which I think some of the others on the panel have done as well, which which is that I realized that in order to get a feel for some of the experiences he had traveling around the world as a sailor, I should just do it myself because those places are still there and ships are still moving around the world and there are still boats going up and down the Congo River. Uh, and so I went and took sea voyages and I went to Congo and I went to Poland and I saw all the places uh, that he lived in and that gave me a kind of insight into his life as well. Um, the final thing I guess that I was um, 
left with as I tried to actually write the book um, was that I found it really hard to write it because I had this idea. I thought, okay, you know, the life, these different continents, these different novels, these different historical episodes, oh, it all maps up so easily. Uh, and it really was difficult to figure it out. And uh, as I was struggling and struggling and struggling to write it, a friend of mine pointed out, she said, wait, didn't you say that Conrad was sort of depressed all the time and had writer's block all the time? And I said, yeah. And she said, so have you ever heard of counter-transference? <laughs> <And laughs> So, so that was one one issue that I that I faced and managed to sort of get through. But I felt like you can't write a book about a struggling writer without struggling about writing the book. Uh, so that was lesson one. And then lesson two, the final point that I'll leave you on is that I think you know back to this reason you know why are historians skeptical of biography and should they be and so on? I think they shouldn't be. Um, but I think that part of the reason they are is this idea that somehow if you're writing only about an individual, then you're writing about something very narrow and uh, that, that doesn't, you, you know, you're, 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 not, you're not embedding it in the world in, in important ways. And I, I came out of this um, really thinking a lot about something that I think is central to Conrad's own work, which is the idea that every individual is, of course, embedded in social circumstances. And as Karl Marx put it, you know, men and women make their own history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. And so for me, that is why history and biography, I think, need to talk to each other so much, because we all are making our own way in the world, and yet the world is making our way for us as well. You, you hear about some biographers falling in love with their subjects and, and becoming totally obsessed by them. I mean, did, do you, did you have the opposite? Did you find that Conrad was a terrible bore to live with? I mean, did, did you... He's <laughs> this terrible, depressed old Pole I, sitting there getting more and more gloomy and kept with his... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had my moments. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, fall in love with him uh, at all, uh, and I, uh, but I didn't, but I didn't hate him either. I mean, I think I just had this sort of, you know, maybe it's that I never really felt, I never felt that I could hear his voice, uh, which was. Uh, which was interesting because he spoke English in a thick accent, and so that was a funny thing, that I know that he spoke English in a thick accent, but he wrote English so incredibly fluently and humorously and so on that I, I kept on having to try to put these two things together. But I did like, you know what, what endeared me to him in the end? Uh, he had wonderful friendships, very meaningful, long-lasting, multi-layered friendships with both men and women, and that personality of this kind of caring, sometimes curmudgeonly, uh, but engaged and thoughtful friend was the persona that came through. And in the end, that was kind of how I tried to sort of regard him myself. Wade, did you fall in love with Mallory? Or? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I was the only person in the history of the British Empire not to fall in love with him. Um, Actually, I didn't like Mallory very much. No, I, uh, I liked... But how all... long did you live with him for? Well, the book took 12 years. I mean, I... I um, you know, you were saying books find you. I, I was... Um, this began quite innocently at the end of a journey when I traveled overland from Chengdu through Yunnan to Lhasa, about 4,000 kilometers of something called the Ecologi uh, Sino-American Ecological Survey. We just made up the title to get permits to go there. And uh, we happened to cross Everest right when the debacle happened that Krakauer wrote about. And uh, my companion was nursed on Everest. His father was a great friend of Howard Somerville's. And Daniel was particularly dis disturbed by the commercialization of Everest. And the next fall, we were on the east face of Everest in the Kenshung face at Pitanringbo. And that's where you stand on ground higher than anything in Europe. And you're staring up at two vertical miles of ice that rise to the South Pole. And Daniel, in his inimitable way, began to speak of these Englishmen in tweeds who read Shakespeare to each other in the snow at 23,000 feet. And I was immediately hooked. And I instantly knew that I didn't care. I mean, the, the fundamental story, if it's not known to you, um, is the British, having lost the race to the two poles, sort of grabbed onto Everest as a third pole and made three attempts to climb it, to scout it in 1921, to attempt to climb it in 22, and finally in 24, um, George Mallory, the most illustrious climber in the empire, with his young companion, Sandy Irvin, were seen going strong for the top in the Northeast Ridge when the, when the, the mist rolled in and enveloped their memory in mist. And they were never seen alive again. And the question that haunted mountaineers, did they get to the top or not before they met their end? From the start, I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to know who these men were 
and what was the spirit that carried them aloft. And there had been books in those expeditions, but they tended to view the, um, the other characters on the expedition as support figures for Mallory, and they tended to view those expeditions as isolated in time. Whereas I knew just from the age and the class of these men that the vast majority of the 26 who participated in those three expeditions would have gone through the agony of the Great War. And my, my sense from the very start was that they wouldn't have been cavalier about death, but they would have seen so much of it that it had nothing to teach them save that of their own. And that perhaps for that entire generation, life mattered less than the moments of being alive. And maybe that accounted for why Mallory kept going on that fateful day. And so from the very start, I set out with the goal of finding out where each of those 26 men had been every single day of the four years and the four months of the Great War, and to ascertain to the extent that I could what they had been exposed to. Well, it turned out that six of the men had escaped the war, a school teacher, diplomat, too old, too young, but 20 had seen the worst of the fighting. And one of the things about that war that we forget is how condensed it was. The entire British sector of the front for much of the war was only 85 miles long. And before the, behind that front, they built 6,000 miles of trenches, 6,000 miles of railroad. And because the war was so documented, it was famously said, for example, of Passchendaele and the Somme, that the British army lacked the clerk power to tabulate the dead. Well, if true, they kept records of everything else. And it's amazing that men found time to fight. And in addition to that, in the wake of the war, as you well know, there was this cathartic tsunami of literature, of poetry, of journals, of memoirs, of diaries, of letters. So there was no point in that battlefield that hadn't been documented every single day in multiple voices from the bombastic um, uh, boasting of a Yorkshire sergeant to a young subaltern shattered in shell shock. So I was literally able to not only find out where each man was every single day, but then to ascertain with a specificity that would have been unimaginable before the war what they had actually endured. And, and that was all part of a research process. When I submitted the, a letter casually to my agent, the letter actually said all that, and it actually said that life matters less than the moments of being alive, which is a line that ends a book. And then three months later, the, 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 the book they, they, he got me the biggest book advance in the history of mountaineering. And then three months later, they found Mallory's body, and there were going to be 10 books out by fall. So I offered to give all the money back, and they said, we didn't pay all that money for a book on Mallory. We want a book by you on Mallory, so get on with it. And I flippantly said, it's going to take 10 years, and it took 12 years. Um, but it f was a gift because it forced me to go deeper and deeper into the process. So for that one book, I purchased 600 books. I visited 57 archives. Um, I, to understand the story from the Tibetan point of view, I lived for months in a monastery in Nepal under Tusta Rinpoche, who was a spiritual heir, Zat Rinpoche, who was at wrong book when Mallory came through in 22 and 24. I got the autobiography, the Namtar of Zat Rinpoche, translated by monks and, and the other thing about those expeditions, they weren't isolated in time or history. They were all part of the great imperial adventure. I mean, it was young husband's invasion that shattered the Tibet, Tibetan army, brought on the wrath of the Chinese, drove the Dalai Lama the 13th back into the arms of Charles Bell. Permission to uh, attempt Everest in 1921 was all part of a complex uh, diplomatic initiative, which was a, essentially an arms deal upon which the Tibetan army would be rebuilt. And similarly, in the wake of Mallory's death uh, in 1924, even as he was succumbing on the mountain, F.M. Bailey was in Lhasa fomenting revolution in favor of the modernization plans of the 13th Dalai Lama against the conservative monasteries. And then when John Noel, who financed the third expedition with film rights, when Mallory's death turned the adventure from a success to a eulogy, Noel was really nervous about how this would go across. And so to gussy up the premiere, he brought seven monks from Gyantse at the Strand Theater, had a theatrical designer make it look like a Tibetan monastery. And the film itself had scenes that were deeply offensive to Tibetans, but critically, those seven lamas did not get, the monks did not get permission from their abbot to come to the West. And so because of that, um, the Dalai Lama was forced to renounce the film, renounce the expeditions, and in fact, F.M. Bailey had to retreat to Darjeeling. The revolution of the uprising never happened. The monastic orders kept their hold over the um, country, 
and come 1949 and 1959, China was not in the position, I mean, Tibet wasn't in the position it might have been to resist the Red Guard or the, Chi the Chinese uh, army. And so they, they were always rooted in time and space and history. Um, and uh, one, 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 one thing that's interesting is, and I know that you can just, from all these um, wonderful authors, is that, you know, Truman Capote said of Jack Kerouac, there's writing and there's typing. And uh, I would say, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's research and there's Xeroxing. And um, uh, all the other books in Maori had been essentially Xerox versions of Audrey Selkild's in initial book. And the, the terrifying thing for me, of course, is I had this big book advance, I had this job, all these books were going to be coming out. What was there to actually find? Well, it turned out there was everything to find, but I didn't know that at the time. But then a really special thing happened. I was in a little archive at the White Museum, which is a museum of the Canadian Rockies, and the one unsung hero of Everest is a man called Oliver Wheeler. It wasn't George Mallory who found the key to the mountain, the route to the North Coal. It was a surveyor, Oliver Wheeler, seconded to the expedition by the Survey of India. And Mallory hated Canadians. I don't know how you hate a Canadian, but he <laughs> hated Canadians. And he was always dismissive of Wheeler. And yet Wheeler was climbing, f making first ascents in the Canadian Rockies when George Mallory was doing somersaults at Winchester. And when it came time finally to assault the North Coal, to climb higher than any humans had ever gone in 1921, the one person that Mallory took with him was Oliver Wheeler. And then later Mallory saved Wheeler's life by staying up all night rubbing his legs with whale oil. But that archive is said to me, you know, I think that Oliver Wheeler's son might still be alive in Vancouver. I made a beeline to Vancouver and found John Wheeler alive, living five doors from the house I was born in. <laughs> and he was a real gentleman. Um, you know, the Wheeler family was illustrious. The grandfather, Arthur, had founded the Alpine Club of Canada. He had surveyed the border between British Columbia and Alberta. Our man Oliver, who went on to become Survey General of India, knighted in World War II for having created 50 million maps, he was the youngest Dominion surveyor, and, and so I saw John, and at this point, all British historians said that only one journal was kept in 1921. Uh, Guy Bullock's um, um, account, which was published by the Alpine Club in London in 1962. Wheeler, Mallory never kept a journal, and, and Howard Burry had reports back to the Times. But this was, and so I'm talking to this man, a wonderful man, um, John Wheeler, and in the middle of this, he simply reaches behind him and pulls from his shelf two fat journals, which turn out to be the journals his father has kept as he walks across Tibet Whoa. in 1921. And I was simply breathless. I knew they'd be full of interesting things, but more importantly, it told me if the British historians haven't found this, what else haven't they found? And so I, I was too polite and Canadian to ask to borrow these things. So, <laughs> We had this wonderful conversation, and what happens in Canada, at the end it all becomes social. What school did you go to? Well, he went to the same boarding school my father had gone to. Uh, I had climbed all these peaks in remote northern British Columbia. He had surveyed. Anyway, as I go out the door, he suddenly takes these two volumes, and he says, you know, son, I think these will be very helpful to you. <laughs> and I, I kept those for 12 years, and the family never asked what became of them. So now we just made a 90-minute documentary feature film on Oliver Wheeler. We're starting a campaign to have him posthumously given the, the Order of Canada. I mean, it's just unbelievable, this man. And on the day that he died, in 1962, I later found out all his journals going back to 1898. The day this man, utterly unknown to Canadians, died, the last journal entry in his journal, indisputably in his own hand, uh, in pencil, and he was the greatest soldier we ever produced in Canada, virtually, is the word died. He announced his own death, you know. Um, and so, you know, it just... Um, but one quick anecdote to give you a sense of how the link between the war and the mountain. I never said, this happened in the war, therefore this happened on the mountain. I was just saying that if you want to understand these men, how can you ignore the fact that they spent this time at the front.
On the approach march in 1921, um, uh, a man called Kellis, high-altitude physiologist, 56 years old, too old for Everest, uh, virtually dies of exhaustion, and he's buried in the shadow of a fortress in the Tibetan plateau called Campuzon. On the day of his internment, Wheeler's entry in his journal reads, well, they buried the old boy in the morning. Thought it was going to be the afternoon. Terribly fo sorry to have missed it, but I do hate funerals. Well, how do you miss the internment of someone you're walking across Tibet with, one of six men? Well, I knew the answer would lie on the Western Front. He was a soldier, soldier. He was... Um, he graduated from our equivalent of West Point, Royal Military Academy, the most decorated cadet in the history of the institution. He was a royal engineer. He went over. He ended up with the 7th Murder Division, which immediately at the outbreak of hostilities went back to France by October of 1914. By that point, the British Expeditionary Force was annihilated. The entire British sector of the front was held by the Canadians in the north, the Indian Army in the south. And both sides, the, topo the topography of Armageddon was in place, and both sides had begun to sap each other. And it came to the attention of Wheeler's command that the Germans put two saps within 30 feet of their front line, and he was given the order to go over the top and bury those saps in a way that would dissuade the Germans from using that tactic again. He goes over the top with 125 men, he's a lieutenant, all hell breaks loose, very lights, mortars, machine gun, artillery. And he finds to his horror that the saps are full of Germans about to attack them. So the result is this melee of hand-to-hand -hand combat of the most ferocious sort. The Indians finally push the uh, Germans back, but not between this, before the saps are lined three bodies deep, chest to chest, of dying boys on both sides, flailing about, as he wrote in his journal, like trout in my crail. And he, as a royal engineer, had to bury them alive. So when he says in India, I mean in Tibet, I do hate funerals, that's what he's referring to. And that's the way the war played into the lives of these climbers. We've got time for, I think, a few questions. Just a quick one to you, Wade, before we open it up. Um, it wasn't, I was just thinking after Simon's uh, tour de force, uh, wasn't George Mallory also a nudist? Was he what? Wasn't he also a nudist, Mallory? He, he famously posed for Duncan Grant, and he said, I love the naked me. I mean, you know, the didn't he climb? That, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, the one of the, I mean... Didn't he climb? He, and it's Patrick French's Young Husband book has a picture of a naked George Mallory halfway up on Everest, doesn't it? Mm, no, he, yeah. used to, he used to swim naked in Sikkim en route um, beyond... Yeah, he, he yeah. loved that, yeah. I mean, one of the funny things about this huge book Conrad advance is used. that the British tabloids <laughs> tripled it, and it was like I had won the lottery. And... Uh, and then the rumor went around London, obviously, how does a Canadian anthropologist or botanist get all this money for a book on our icon? And the rumor is out that I must have found out that George Mallory had a homosexual affair <laughs> in Toronto in 1923 on a speaking engagement. Well, all, speaking of research, all you had to do is go to British Library, and the only question was who in England hadn't tried to bed George Mallory? He only had, he only had he was one... He George, gorgeous George, wasn't he? Well, you know, I mean, but this is Cambridge. You know, John Maynard Keynes at Cambridge was known as the iron copulating machine. I mean, um, you know, there was this very kind of interesting Edwardian thing. You can't use terms like homosexual or it doesn't make any sense. It was just this thing that happened. I mean, Lytton Strachey, James Strachey. I mean, James Strachey, Mallory was in love with James Strachey. And, uh, uh, and there, he's the only f male he had sex with. And that was in this room of this, other, this guy at Oxford, uh, Cambridge, rather. You know, so but it was just a whole different thing. I mean, you know, Bosey Douglas, uh, uh, Oscar Wilde's lover, went to Winchester just seven years before Mallory and said famously that 90% of the boys had sex with each other and the only ones who didn't were the ugly ones. I mean, <laughs> so this was just part of this. You know how the, the, Brit the, you know, the British kept their dogs at home and sent their boys to kennels? I mean, that, that's what, <laughs> that's what, you know. So this, this was just, you know, uh, uh, you know. I think we should go to questions quickly. <laughs> Please, someone ask one now. <laughs> Gentleman at the back there with a the beard. Thank you. 
I had a question about Conrad being one of the most famous non-native uh, writers of English. And have you looked at how um, that affected his writing, his English being his second language? Third language. Third language. Yeah, yeah. he spoke French uh, second as a yeah. as a boy. He learned it as a boy. Um, you know, there's been linguistic analysis of Conrad, which has uh, tried to find. Uh, foreign usages and so forth. I mean, the main thing to note about Conrad, however, is that his English is, uh, the, 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 no, no one reading Conrad now would look at that and say, oh, you know, this guy was not a native speaker. We have absolutely no ability to, to tell because the man was obviously a linguistic genius. Uh, and I would add to that that uh, we can kind of tell that language learning ran in his family because his father was also a man of letters and wrote poetry and plays and translated from uh, French into Polish. And also, interestingly, during a short time when he was in prison, uh, he was given by his wife at his own request, quote, Robertson's uh, lessons for learning English, unquote. And from this book, he obviously taught himself English well enough to translate Dickens from English into Polish. So that's Conrad's father. And then we get Conrad, who's being, you know, tutored by his father in all kinds of ways. Uh, so, you know, it's miraculous. Uh, Nabokov, of course, is someone who wielded English as well as anyone who has lived has wielded English. Uh, Nabokov learned English uh, as a boy, however, unlike Conrad. And I think with him you see something that you don't see so much with Conrad, which is a play with language. Yes. Uh, and Conrad doesn't really do that, and I think he's more Conrad's interested... Conrad's not a pro stylist, is he? No, no I that. mean, I think Conrad is more interested in... Uh, you know, he's interested in just expressing, you know, his ideas. He's not interested in the kind of phenomenon of language as a part of expression in the way that Pun, Nabokov and... Puns and wordplay, yeah. Exactly. Right. You don't really find that in him. But I think that the, the final thing I would say about it is that I think that for anybody... You know, first of all, I think any writing is a kind of translation, right? I mean, we're all looking at things and thinking about things, and we're then putting it into language in the same way maybe a painter puts it, puts it into paint. And uh, so Conrad is doing that. Uh, uh, but I would say that his, uh, you know, his frame of literary references uh, would have had a lot of French literature, would have had a lot of Polish literature. His sort of sensitivity to the sort of the multiplicity of voices, which is a feature of his narrative style, I think, is something that 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 may uh, be related to his own uh, polyglot uh, quality. Oh. Um, I'm wondering this how many. Okay, no, no, you go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, wondering how many of you have read Jeff Dyer's struggles to write a biography of uh, D.H. Lawrence, because it's one of the it's it's about everything that you're talking about on on stage. Are you familiar with it? You know Jeff, don't you, Matt? I do. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. And in fact, I can, uh, what Willie is prompting me to say uh, is that uh, I met Jeff at Jaipur. And in fact, I think we were on this very session uh, together at Jaipur. And one of the things I'd like to say about the Jaipur Festival is it brings together writers, of course, across lots of genres. And uh, for me, otherwise being stuck in the... In, in the academy, everybody will know, you, you sort of get stuck with people who don't care very much about writing. Uh, and it's really nice to uh, get the chance to, uh, for example, uh, learn about other writers and then read books with which one finds an uncanny uh, sense, of, uh, sense of recognition. <laughs> but have you read this book? I have, it's a fabulous book. <laughs> I have, I started by saying I had. Yeah, yeah, it was excellent. The oh. big problem at the moment is, uh, is the biography of Susan Sontag which is uh, being written at the moment, and all sorts of lawsuits and problems. Why? Well, because there's this son, David Reef, who many of you may know. He's um, essentially in the first contract with, I think, FSG, had a right of, um, to vet the script and to, um, and to reject it, and he has. And uh, Anyway, Susan Sontag, obviously a somewhat controversial figure, um, whether that biography ever comes out, we will see. I'm just trying to remember who the author was. Apparently the three commissioned biographies of Mick Jagger, which are under lock and key. Oh, yes. As well. Uh, I remember one of them was by John, um, he worked for the Sunday Times, and I remember... That's right. He spent ten years at it or something. Yeah, he, he spent ten years at it, sent it to Jagger, who wrote back in pencil on the cover one word, pedestrian. 
Would that be because Jagger had the right to refuse, or was it because the editors... Um... They were all three official biographies yeah, that she didn't exactly. like. Exactly. Have we got time to tell my dirty... Not a dirty story, but the... Dirty story. Well, I don't know, because there's this lady with a clock. Who... No, d definitely a d dirty story. <laughs> well, a dirty story. Okay. <laughs> Well, the thing about this is going back to... Joseph Short, dirty. Jo well, it's quite long, but it won't be very long. Joseph Needham, anyway, married. He's a biochemist. He marries another biochemist. They settle down for a settled life in, in the academy, although a nudist, communist, chain-smoking, Morris We don't have that in Harvard Yard. ...version of the academy. Um, and he has this interest in other ladies. And then a lady comes from Shanghai... Uh, to study for a DPhil or a PhD under Dorothy Needham's supervision. She comes, she, her name is Lu Gui Jen, and um, so she comes over on the boat from Shanghai to London and then the train to Cambridge and then is introduced to Dorothy, who fatally says, I think you ought to meet my husband, and then takes um, this Gui Jen down the corridor to meet this, he looks like a sort of like Harry Potter on amphetamines. I mean, <laughs> very tall, brown hair and little circular glasses and things. But he is immensely attractive and is hugely attracted to her. So the thing, the relationship isn't fully consummated until Valentine's Day 1937. And on that particular occasion, Dorothy is down in Devon seeing her parents and Joseph sees his chance. The film The Good Earth is opening in Cambridge, so he takes Gwei Jen to see it, and she, as Joseph surmises or suspects, she becomes um, tearful and nostalgic, and in his view, possibly somewhat pliant. So he then, <laughs> he takes her to what was then the most expensive restaurant in Cambridge, 1937, the Venetian, and in turn, he kept everything, and so the bill is there, saying that a considerable quantity of wine was taken. And then they walk back to Keys College, Cambridge, where he is in room, ground floor, in staircase K, room two, a room occupied until recently by, um, um, what's that chap, uh, Stephen Hawking. So very distinguished scientists occupied that room. And he then applies her without gather a little bit of port, I think. And then, in his diary, you see three asterisks, which suggests to me either something happened three times or something happened once, which merited three asterisks. <laughs> but, but immediately after it, and this is the most touching thing, is you see first in pencil, and then committed to pen, the first Chinese character he ever wrote in his life. It's actually two characters, um, and I'm wondering if anyone in the audience who doesn't know the answer can suspect what the character should be after a three-asterisk event with this comely young Chinese uh, scientist. Well, someone was... Ni Hao, yeah, that's... Yeah, hello. No, I don't think so. Um, uh, and nor was it love, you know, like Wo Ai Ni or something like that, nor was it his name. Um, it was, in fact, cigarette. Because... <laughs> And you can imagine the moment he bought players full strength or capstan full strength, and after the three, the event, he took two rather like in the movie now Voyager. Put oh, this is my fancy. Put both in his mouth, lit them both, passed one to Guijian who also smoked, inhaled, and then looked at this sort of cylinder of tobacco in its paper, and said, Guijian, how do I write this in Chinese? And she showed him. And he practiced and sitting in bed and finally got it. And the Chinese character for cigarette are the two characters for fragrant smoke. And he got it, put it from pencil into pen, and then wrote in his diary, at that moment, I passed through a, a gate which completely changed my life into the world of Chinese ideographic writing. And I entered an entirely new universe. And although he kept his interest in biochemistry for the rest of his life, from then on, from age 37 to his death in 95, he was committed utterly to studying China and how the Chinese effectively got there first in the making of almost everything from the stirrup to the wheelbarrow to vaccination to air conditioning, you name it, the Chinese got there first. Which is, and, and you may wonder what happened to Gui Zhen. 
She remained living on the same street as he did in Cambridge. He married and re remained married to Dorothy. She died in 1987, whereupon he married Wei Jen, who had been waiting in the wings for 52 wow. years. <laughs> she then died three years later, and this randy old sod still wrote to three other women, including the director of the Toronto Art Gallery, saying, I'm still around, and I'd be very keen <laughs> to marry again. Shot worn though I may be, I have some years left in me, but none responded to the challenge, and he died single. <laughs>